Good afternoon, everybody. It, it's hard to believe we're talking about the future. We're talking about robots, and we're in a converted meat locker in the middle of a storm. It's truly sort of the start of a dystopian society. Um, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here today to have a chance to talk to you about what I hope is a start of a discussion, and hopefully we'll continue it on through the panel, about how do we start to create an AI ecosystem, creating convergence between government, academia, research, as well as large corporates like ourselves, HSBC, to actually start to solve some of the industrial problems that are out there that can be leveraged using AI. So in order to frame the conversation, what I'd first like to do is actually talk a bit about our AI journey and give you a sense of the types of problems that we're facing and why we have embarked on what we're calling Project Phoenix, looking at creating AI partnerships with some of the cutting edge firms around the world. So if I take a step back, I started at HSBC in 2017. And when I arrived, I was really surprised at the state of what our data state looked like. As you can appreciate, we're large. We're in 67 different countries. We've got, because of regulatory acquisitions, a variety of different reasons, we've got 50 versions of our core banking systems, 50 credit systems, 50 trading systems. You get the picture. And so all of this data is spread around this vast estate. And part of the challenge that we had to solve was, how do you put all of this data together? When you think about it, putting, aggregating all of these types of data in different formats from different sources, it's an enormous task. If I asked you, how much do you think it would cost to go and put all of this data together, what would you think? When I talked to consulting firms, when I talked to technology, when I talked to, and, and got a survey, I got price ranges in between 100 million to 300 million, and that it would take three to five years. Clearly, we didn't have the money, nor did I have the time, and you know, I was probably going to be retired by the time I'd actually see that through. So we had to look for an alternative. And that's really where our journey started with big data and machine learning. We had to look for something, a new way of working, and a new way to actually address you know, this vast data estate. So what we did was we did a POC in one country, well, we took all the data in that country, pulled it all together into a single environment. We then used machine learning to join up all of that data at the most granular transaction level. And that POC then led to a full-blown execution where we've created, and what we've created, I'm very proud of creating, is the world's largest uh, wholesale banking uh, big data environment. So we've taken data from those 67 different countries. We've pulled it together. That's our trading data, our credit data, our core banking, our reference data, pulling it all together. And then the secret sauce, we've used machine learning to join up those trillions of transactions. You've got to imagine, across this vast data state, yeah, that is hundreds of systems, thousands of applications, trillions of transactions. And we're joining up those transactions at the most granular level. So joining up those trillions of transactions using machine learning. For us, when we started pulling all of this together, as you can imagine, whether or not you're, you're leveraging the data for data science, visualization, creating applications, the quality of your data and the quality of your output is dependent on what the data quality is. So we had to put data quality at the heart of what we did. And so as we started taking all of this data and pulling it together, we actually measured all of the data as it was coming into the lake, so leveraging the chief data office and starting to put those data quality measurements. The next piece was then we can form that data using the secret sauce, putting the machine learning together, linking it, and then we'd go through a validation process to actually validate. And as you can imagine with machine learning, the more issues that you find with the actual validation process, the smarter the machine comes. And then that validation becomes a virtuous circle in order to make the data uh, of higher quality. We would then go through, tag the metadata, and then put it into an information asset registry. That gives us an indexed, reusable data asset. But that's just building a foundation, and really still at the very start of our journey. So the next step, was we actually had to create functions and capabilities of people to actually utilize that data. So we announced recently, we built a innovation and data lab. We built two bit innovation and data labs, one in London and one in Toronto. 
And we're very excited about these labs because these labs contain our data science, our data engineering, and it inc includes our robotics, our cloud people, people who are in transformation, so that we can create these business-driven uh, agile pods. That facilitates and allows us at a rapid pace to go from business problem to taking the data insight to being able to deploy code or build applications in a rapid fashion. But one of the things as I've done different speeches like this before, I've talked about is one of the key things that we've had to build um, right at the get-go is actually data privacy, ethics, and data sharing. We ta I talked about how the data quality is really important, but actually, in an organization like ours, when we have to go through 67 different countries, over 100 different regulators, if you're not actually allowed to use the data, it renders all the things that we've built in the lab, these functions that we've created, redundant. And so building a data sharing, privacy, and ethics team is actually paramount. It's not just understanding how do I move the data from one jurisdiction to another, but also with all the new privacy rules, whether or not it's GDPR or the California privacy standard, how do I actually address can I, and is it in the best interest of clients? But more importantly, adding the ethics component is also critical, and we needed to embed that in our process. The can we use the data and the should we use the data has to absolutely be part of everything we do, whether or not we're tackling a use case, building an algo, or producing a product for a client. And so that's part of what we've done in terms of pulling all of this stuff into the journey and, and building this in the lab. But having the data and having the people doesn't necessarily allow us to monetize the data itself. And we, what we recognized as we started to look at the types of use cases we had was that we needed assistance. When we initially put the business case together for big data, we went around to different groups and said, what's your appetite for big data? What are the types of problems you have? And what I personally was really surprised to discover was without even blinking an eye, we had over 100 different use cases. And those use cases ranged in three sorts of buckets. First was sort of financial crime and compliance. And you can imagine as a bank as large as ours in a digital era, fighting financial crime is one of the biggest imperatives that we had. And so many use case, there were many use cases around that area. The second area was operational, creating operational efficiencies, improving the customer experience. So how do we start to take, whether or not it's something as simple as a credit approval process, which by the way, in a bank like ours, isn't that simple, but how do we start to actually be able to monitor and evaluate client data internally and externally and actually create a perpetual sort of credit approval process so that you didn't actually need to go through a you know, cumbersome credit approval process every time you wanted to renew a facility, thereby improving the customer experience. And the third category was commercial. One of the key things and one of the key drivers for us with big data is how do we build a better understanding of our clients, what our clients' needs are, whether or not that's working capital, whether or not it's supply chain. How do we understand our clients better, anticipate what they're going to need, and then shape our products so that it actually meets what our clients want? And that was a key driver for all of this. And, and those three buckets of use cases uh, constituted the driver for our big data program. So we needed to look externally. And that's where Project Phoenix was born. Pro our goal of Project Phoenix was to go and scour the world to identify cutting edge AI firms to help us on this journey. What we wanted to do and the intention was partner with these AI firms to co-develop uh, products, applications, services. And the intention was leverage the knowledge, the cutting edge in terms of these firms, but leverage it on our data set. We have one of the largest, most complex data sets that's available. And by being able to utilize it, harness that data, and build products off it, if you can solve our problem, chances are, and our problem, you can solve many other financial institutions' problems. And that was sort of the intention of Project Phoenix. So we needed a partner to do Project Phoenix. And that's where we enlisted the assistance of Cognition X. We needed a partner who actually understood the AI space, who had the connections, and who could actually go and reach out and, act, and, and help us scour the world to find these cutting edge firms. 
So Glenn Smith, who's actually going to moderate the panel, has actually been the, one of the key drivers for the RFI process as we went through and started to identify these firms. We started off with 18 firms. What surprised me as we started to go through the process was, in the, those initial 18 firms, was that many people started to put up their hands. The more publicity we got, the more that people became aware of it. Many other firms who weren't part of the process put up their hands. And by the time we were said and done, we were over 30 people. So as we were evaluating it in the RFI process, we had to put them through some sort of process. And what we did was we, we created a scorecard. Um, and the scorecard was done in conjunction with Cognition X. It was done within our, with our procurement function, and it was also done with our data science. What was surprising, and as we get to the observations about the Project Phoenix process, was the results. The whole philosophy and what we intended about Project Phoenix was to actually go and find those niche players or those people who were going to be the most cutting edge in AI. I, perhaps naively so, presumed that that was going to be small boutique AI players. What actually ended up happening as we actually got the results from Project Phoenix was that actually the top 10 was dominated by large consulting firms. And it was interesting because if I'm going to be really honest and sort of make a confession here, when we started the process and some of the big consulting firms approached me and said, look, we want to be part of it, I actively discouraged them from participating. And may, it may be my bias as a former consultant, um, or it, it may have been my na naivety. But one of the things that really came across as we looked at the process was that actually the consulting firms had made a significant investment in AI over the last few years and had actually become some of the leading players in development, which was a huge surprise to us. But the more disconcerting aspect of that was that actually in that top 10 that was dominated by consulting players, there were only a couple of what I would have called AI dominated or AI focused uh, firms that were 100% sort of AI. And that, was, that caused a lot of concern for us. We then did a separate evaluation. We said, okay, that criteria, fine. Our procurement had been involved, so there were some aspects of it like, you know, ability from a customer service to service a client like ours experience in terms of dealing with multiple use cases for with large corporates such as ourselves. So we said, let's put that aside for one second and let's put a new criteria. Let's just look at just the AI tech, the research, the development, the actual technical capabilities that these, fi these firms have. And as a result of running this new criteria, there were more firms that appeared in the top 10 but the majority still ended up being the consulting firms. So that caused a lot of discussion and debate both internally and with Cognition X. When we started looking at that, asking the question, why is that the case? Is that what we expected? And, there were, and what do we do about it more importantly? Part of the, th part of the challenge that we, we saw was the fact that many of the smaller firms, whilst they were very good in their specific field, they were very niche in terms of the problem that they were trying to solve. Unfortunately, when you look at a firm like ours and you look at the scale of the problems that we're trying to solve, part of the challenge when you start to engage multiple software providers, boutiques, fintechs, and you start to look at your end-to-end -end stack is that if I go through, be it a trade life cycle from trade capture to how it ends up in the ledger, or if I go through a client journey from beginning to end, is you start to end up with vendor stack, vendor stack, vendor stack, vendor stack, vendor stack, all over each other. And the problem is, that becomes very cumbersome in order to be able to maintain. And every time you want to start updating the stack and rearranging it and, and start to streamline it, it becomes very co costly. For us, what we wanted in the, in the Project Phoenix process was neither to buy software nor to have a consulting firm just give us a solution and build something for us. We wanted to build an ecosystem and build our own environment so that actually, as we start to change our client offering or streamline our processes, we could actually make those in alterations all the way through a, a trade life cycle or a client life cycle. 
So we started to have a discussion and sort of say, what are the things that we can do to spur on this development and, and, and to help encourage some of the smaller players to be able to interact with us? The first thing we identified was the fact that actually we needed to create some sort of forum, dialogue, mechanism that actually we could engage with some of these smaller players in the, in the AI space and talk about what our problems were. Part of the challenge was people may be coming to us with great product that solves a specific problem, but actually our problem might be actually much larger than that. So we, act, so we needed to create that dialogue for them to understand, hey, this is what we're trying to solve for, and how can we partner together to co-develop things to, to, to solve it. The second piece was that, and I'll admit it, you know, because I personally get very frustrated by it, is when you're dealing with a firm like ours, nobody quite, nothing quite prepares you for what it's like to deal with procurement, an RFI process, all of sort of the, the joys that come with dealing with the large corporates. And part of that is an education process with some of the smaller players who may not have actually had experience dealing with a company like ours. And part of it is incumbent on us to actually create a, a process that expedites this. So one of the things that we've taken as an action is to actually create a fintech accelerator process within our, our bank to identify how do we, you know, get things to a sandbox environment? How do we deal with the procurement process? How do we deal with the education of these firms so that we can actually make it much more seamless and you much more willing to, to work with us? And the third piece is a broader one, which is there are some big problems that we have to solve as regulations change, as you know, we deal with new entrants from a financial services perspective, from fintechs and other emerging uh, disruptors in the industry. So there's some large problems that we have to solve. And that's not just going to be solved by dealing with one party. It's going to be solved by actually creating this ecosystem, an ecosystem between academia through research and development and some of the industri industry players, as well as some large consulting firms. And creating that ecosystem is very important. And one of the things that struck me in the role that I have is that it's symptomatic of a broader problem here in the UK. So if I give an example, recently I was in China, and, and we spent a lot of time in China actually meeting with some of the fintechs as well as meeting with some of our competitors. And what you see in China has been a very concerted effort between government with some of the players as well as some of the people in the industry working together to start solving some of the big problems that they have within that industry. In Canada, uh, where we've set up our uh, Toronto lab, our in innovation and, and data lab, you also see that ecosystem that's occurring, that trifecta between government, academia, and industry working together, not only developing the talent, but actually working at, together to solve some of the big problems within particular industries. And part of you know, my discussion with Cognition X and part of what I'm hoping to have as a discussion today is how do we start to spur that same convergence here in the UK of actually starting to create an ecosystem that academia, government, in, uh, AI players, as well as large corporates can work together, almost create sort of open source frameworks, even tools to solve some of these major problems. And that's been the goal of what we wanted to do in terms of uh, some of the activities within our AI journey and where we see that next stage, the AI journey. So. I, I talked about the Canadian system and, and part of what we've seen and, and part of the ecosystem. And so part of what we saw with that convergence of government industry was the emergence of some key players. And actually, that got us very excited. It was one of the reasons that we actually put our, uh, one of our first labs in Toronto. And so one of the things that I'm very pleased to get to announce to you today is the first partnership that we're doing, the collaboration partnership that we're doing with Project Phoenix. And that's with Element AI out of Montreal, Canada. Uh, we selected Element AI for Montreal, Canada for several reasons. One, they have been a true leader in terms of the development of AI and driving some of the things around NLP, deep learning, um, and other uh, aspects of AI. Secondly, they were a disruptor, and that's part of what we were looking for, was creating you know, 
companies that were actually creating that disruptive effect who were good, you know, be willing to partner. And the third thing was they were participating in that ecosystem that we were seeing thriving in Canada. And actually, we were very keen that our Toronto lab especially was going to be able to work with them and start to put out what our problems were and then actually work through a discovery phase to, to um, come up with new solutions. And so we're very proud and very pleased to, to be able to announce today that partnership with Element AI. Uh, Eve is actually part of the panel, so he'll, he will have an opportunity to uh, speak to his perspective. So I'm next going to hand it over to Glenn, but without stealing his thunder, um, to be able to continue this conversation. So I'll let Glenn do the formal introductions of the panel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Chuck. Uh, it was a real honor to be asked by HSBC to help them out in Project Phoenix. And that was on the basis of our great connectivity we have through COGX and the networks that we have formed through doing this fantastic event over the last few years. But I'd like to bring the panelists up, the sta up on stage now. Guys, why don't you all come up and I'll, I'll see if coming up in one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so we have uh, Jeremy Palmer here from uh, Quantum Black, uh, who are uh, part of McKinsey now. We have Barbara Johnson from a, a, a startup called Cortical, which we discovered through the part of the process, and we'll let Barbara talk to, about Cortical in a little bit. And uh, we have Eve from Element AI, which Chuck mentioned. But to kick off the conversation, one of the first things, or where do you start off any AI project when you're a big corporate, one of the key things is uh, as a proof of concept. So uh, that's the first question uh, I would have around what's the best way to get proofs of concept set up within a big corporation to connect the, the big companies and the smaller, smaller companies that can come in and help them do that. Eve, well, could you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everybody. So um, <clears throat> the proof of concept is uh, mandatory for those kind of new AI initiatives. The way uh, the financial institutions used to interact with technology was either to buy uh, a software from an independent uh, software provider and uh, to integrate that in the system, or the alternative was to hire uh, a system integrator that will build uh, a solution for the own needs of the financial institution and that will be unique uh, to this uh, partner. It doesn't work quite well uh, with, uh, with AI because you need to train the model, you need to uh, have the data constantly uh, being fed uh, to the model. So uh, AI requires actually our new types of initiatives where the big corporations, financial institutions will bring the data, but not only the data, uh, will bring a couple of data scientists that understand well uh, the full value chain that will help on connecting uh, with the companies uh, to interact with. Those companies will obviously be uh, startup-like uh, or uh, other uh, types of, um, of partners. And they will start actually interacting with those data. They will start uh, small, but with an end goal of bringing that to operations. So the first proof of concept is let's start. Let's start with something, putting together the talents that uh, those uh, companies, startups are bringing, the data, and indeed the ecosystem around that that will bring to fruition those products into operations. So the sandbox, this proof of concept, is the first step, and we'll see later that putting that in operations will really require a couple of, a couple of other uh, aspects. And Barbara, I know Cortical are involved in that area as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone starts with a proof of concept. It helps everyone give confidence to what AI can achieve. Um, and also, I think what we found a lot of, um, I guess, uh, challenges have been found around data quality and so it does uncover whether there is some value within that proof of concept to start with um, and also helps build up a business case to understand you know before you ever go through the whole idea of bringing this whole system into your business uh, what is the value of doing that and so if you stick with those kind of concepts of understanding data the team the talent uh, the tools and also what the business case is going to be it tends to a really good proof of concept and Jeremy Quantum Black have a lot of experience in that for area as well yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and proofs of concept are like our, our best friends and our worst enemies, right? I mean, um, 
uh, Chuck mentioned the challenge of dealing with procurement. Um, we've all been in those situations where you're trying to justify embarking on a project which is quasi-experimental. Uh, you don't exactly know what the outcome's going to be, how well the models will perform, whether the data's good enough. And uh, so proofs of concept are a sort of necessary evil, I guess, to get us to the point where people have a bit more confidence. Um, I think uh, we find um, that this is probably one of our biggest learnings, actually, that uh, the trick is to try to approach a proof of concept as if you were going to productionize it. And I think that's the key lesson here, really. Um, there are so many proofs of concepts, pilots, which are out there. People have started in different parts of the organization. Some work well, some not so well. Uh, that when you try and pull them together and move them to operationalization, to scale, it can get really hard. So we have to live with proofs of concept, I guess, but um, let's make sure that when we go about starting them, we're thinking about productionization, and that way we won't be wasting the work, whatever goes into it. Yeah. And Chuck, do you want to talk to your experience of organizing proofs of concept within HSBC? Well, one of the key things, and we've learned this lesson the hard way, is you know, once upon a time we would do sort of these big monolithic projects sort of in a, in a traditional sort of waterfall approach. And, and that has a lot of risk because some of these projects can be very successful, but you're waiting several years for them to deliver. And some of them, when they fail, they fail spectacularly. So for us, part of our goal is to break these projects down into much smaller deliverables, do POCs, and so similar to what I described earlier about the big data situation where we did a small POC in, in one particular country, and then once it's successful, then scale it out globally as rapidly as possible. Cool. That's a very much the agile approach being brought into AI, which is great. But that's, you've all touched on taking proofs of concepts and then moving them into production and the operations. Uh, Barbara, do you want to talk about how you do that at Cortical? Yeah, so uh, Cortical is an AI platform, and so as a result, what you can do is build models on the platform, and then you can deploy them with uh, using our APIs in Python. So it makes the actual management of deployment really simple, and it means also that it gets to be held within the data science team or the business domain expert who wants to know what's going on with their models. And you don't have to wait for a big production pipeline for you know when Dev is ready to take that new piece of code. So uh, and also, there's a really sh like a shortage of trying to get people who can take an AI model and make it software is quite a unique skill and a lot of businesses have not necessarily even thought that far ahead. So, you know, to our point of trying to make those high value proof of concepts, you want to easily be able to rapidly get commercial value from them. So, you know, using tools that know that how can you do that can really help accelerate that process and also give people confidence that you can get value from AI quickly and rather than just talk about it, um, there's some value at the end. Great. And uh, Jeremy, can you talk to that how Quantum Black would do that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I love Chuck's points earlier about collaboration. I think that uh, one of the things that um, I think people uh, underestimate um, often is the importance of business involvement in these discussions. The context is critical. Different types of problems require different types of domain expertise. And I think as practitioners in the analytics space, we need to be humble about that, right? Yeah. So we can't pretend the same solutions work everywhere. And we need to partner very explicitly. Um, I think the other uh, big lesson for us, and in fact, we've, we've made a humble contribution, hopefully, to this ecosystem ourselves in the last week by open sourcing one of the tools that we use called Kedro. Uh, Kedro means core, as you know, and uh, we, this, it's, just, it's the way we do this, exactly what you've talked about, uh, all the lessons we've learned and the mistakes <laughs> we've made over the last few years. And we decided to open source this as a way of making sure that the code libraries and the, the analytics frameworks, the models that we've used, work, which, when we know that it works, we take the software engineering thinking, we apply it to the code, and now everybody hopefully can help us all improve uh, in that core task of moving quicker to production. So we, we're trying to do this faster and faster. We're, the big thing for us is learning. Um, I mean, how do you make sure you learn a lesson once, you make a mistake once, it's hard. Um, but we do this using uh, technology, using consistent uh, approaches, consistent mm -hmm. techniques, uh, and also technology including Kedro, which is now open source. And I hope you'll all contribute to it. <laughs> okay. Enjoy. Okay, great. And Eve, how, how do you deal with that at, at Element? Yeah, so Element AI is a, is a product company, so we are delivering product in the supply chain financial services areas. And uh, being a product company uh, also requires, given the maturity of the market and the nature of this uh, AI market, to uh, do some advisory work. Advisory uh, lies mostly in bringing those uh, business challenges that 
come to uh, POC down to operations. And uh, you need to assess the AI readiness of the company because in the POC, generally, you have the design of the model, you have the uh, data collection, and maybe a, a little bit of design work on how the people will be interacting with that model. But uh, that's only actually a, a very uh, small fraction of what is required to bring those AI products into operations. Indeed, you need uh, certainly to build the products and the, and the, and the development around the POCs, uh, thinking about the core business uh, of the company. So the end-to-end -end, uh, that was uh, mentioned earlier on. Then you need to understand how uh, the engineering uh, environment, the, the engineering ecosystem within the organization, the various, uh, indeed, layers, stacks of uh, tools that already exist, how to interact with those. And you need to understand what will be the latency, what will be the security, what will be the interactions with all those uh, legacy uh, uh, products. And that should be part of this journey between the POC to the operations. And then, we've mentioned that, but it matters a lot, a lot, the procurement process, how to bring a lot of agility, how to bring trust, confidence uh, to the people in procurement as well, how to manage the security, the safety of those data, how to make it sure that the data uh, will be used in a streamlined way uh, when you will need to train, to retrain the models uh, across the line. And then how to monitor that, how to set some tools to be able to monitor the AI across the over time. So all that needs to be considered when you're going from a POC to a model in operations. Okay, Chuck, do you want to well, come on? I, I just want to touch on one thing, and, and, and if I can just share some of the discussions that we initially had with, with Element AI, because this gets to sort of the heart of what I was talking about earlier, which is sort of product versus ecosystem versus the environment. Um, because initially, when we, we, we started talking to Element AI, it was very much about that product focus, but recognizing the complexity of how our organization works and our infrastructure, we weren't going to be able to just simply plug sort of the product into different components. And part of even the, the, the journey that we've gone on together over the last little bit is that conversation shifted to actually how do we work together, how do we co-develop, and how do we build that infrastructure, that ecosystem, and, and, and integrating AI across the HSBC fr uh, front to back infrastructure. Um, so that journey has changed, and the dialogue has changed. Okay. Yeah, just, uh, just picking up on that, I mean, I think we're spending a lot of time on, on proofs of concept here, but I think it's really important to remember the context here. I mean, I think Chuck's described an ambitious mission. I think that the, the key to success in this field, yes, the technology needs to work, and your processes need to work, and you need to be safe, but you really need a leadership ambition here. You really mm -hmm. need to be looking beyond like solving one problem. And as Chuck has described, and we all know this in different fields, in many ways, the, the hardest part is getting leadership on board at the beginning and saying, we have an ambitious vision here, which is going beyond individual proofs of concept, individual use cases, to changing the capabilities that we need for the future, to changing the culture of our organization so everybody's focused on being curious about the data. So I wouldn't want to lose sight of that more ambitious, longer-term yeah. picture within which you know, we need to move through lots of these individual uh, proofs and, 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 uh, and the use cases. Yeah. yeah. yeah absolutely. And I will add that uh, the market of AI is a little bit different from the market of big data. With big data, you need it to be an aggregator. Data matter a lot, and either you were this aggregator, you were able to own the data or to capture the data from different sources and to monetize that. In the AI, that's about leadership, leadership of your product in your category, being the best there, showing the way, bringing the ecosystem to actually work on your data, to open up a little bit those data, to have the right guidelines around those data, and being able to foster this ecosystem, to be willing to engage in this initiative. And that's what you've done, Chuck, uh, and, and your team. And I think that this leadership in the product, combined with the talents and their, all the energies and creativity coming from the ecosystem, is really what will probably make the success of those AI journeys. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think there's something interesting about, um, you know, when we, when we look around in the space, um, there's often, like, we see things that other people are doing and we think, could we do that? Um, we see successes and failures that other people have had and we try and achieve them 
or avoid them. But I think ultimately, especially for incumbents and big players, the real question is like, how, 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 how fixated and excited are we about capturing the potential of our organization, especially if it's large and it's incumbent? We have a threat, but we also have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's maximize what we can do with our data and using these new capabilities. And it's hard. But I think you need that leadership, you need that ambition, because there's going to be pain as well. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't have the leadership and the ambition, then the pain is harder. And things like procurement are a lot easier if you've got you know, a really clear leadership aligned on this vision, which goes way beyond uh, you know, one proof of, of concept or one pilot. Yeah, that's bringing together a lot of the strategic issues with deploying AI. But one of the key things, and Chuck touched on it on his, in his talk a number of times, is the ethical considerations around that. So when AI gets out of the proof of concept into production, one of the key issues that came out through our research was around AI needs to be explainable to be able to uh, market that, the product to the staff internally and to your final customers. So the explainability of AI becomes very, very important. Uh, Barbara, do you want to talk about how do you make AI explainable? in production? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, part of the platform is, <laughs> I keep going on about the platform, but that's what, mm -hmm. I, what we do. Uh, so it's about um, explainable AI, and we know everything from, uh, you know, NLP, deep neural nets, etc., is all around trying to understand what are the features. And I think, actually, explainable AI helps bring AI to the business domain expert. So you're not just sitting there as a data scientist looking at these features going, you know, oh, that looks like a great model of just got a really, really great score. Actually, in business practice, what does that mean? And I think without having that kind of logic and uh, kind of collaboration towards it means that it's never going to be a good kind of business proof of concept or, or, or even in production. So um, I think explainable AI also helps the leadership problem that we've got. So, you know, you might have someone who's really ambitious within business who's saying, I really want to go after this. I think this is going to be great. And um, being able to explain the reasons why actually builds new insights. So, for example, I mean, healthcare is a very obvious one why that really works. But we are working with the NHS and we're working on kidney matching and improving the wait times. And there's a certain haplotype for only a certain little uh, number of recipients. That's a really big impact. And it's been something that they thought about, but you know, without all the data together, they would never have known. And so now it's really impacting just even clinic clinicians, excuse me, and how they work with their patients. And it's, you know, it's removed from the AI piece itself. And I think that's the power of AI. It can you know, really accelerate a business in more ways than you think is really gonna, gonna be true, and that's through the explainability of it. Yeah, Jeremy, one of the things that impressed us through the process was uh, your articulation of some of the explainability work that you guys have done. Can you talk to that a little bit more as well? Yeah, sure. I mean, I totally, I mean, explainability, uh, I think, is uh, critical. It's one of our top three initiatives uh, at Quantum Black. Um, and we build, um, we have ways of building that into everything that we do. And it's kind of obvious, I suppose, from an ethical and a practical perspective, that if you're telling me that I should take a certain medicine or I'm vulnerable to a certain condition, I'd like to know why you know that. Um, we also know that people managing relationships in a sales situation or any kind of organization, you know, it's much easier if they, if they don't just say, well, the machine says you would like this next, and that you can explain why. So obviously those things are important. Um, and there are lots of ways now we can use uh, ensemble modeling to each get models to interrogate each other and enable that. I think there's another point also, though, and that is that, you know, this is such an immature environment, right? There are no governments that have nailed it yet. I mean, there are some moving faster than others. We don't know where the law is going. We don't know where public appetite is going. We know that it's different in different regions. We know that it'll move at a different pace. And we know the stuff coming at us which we can't see yet. Therefore, it just makes sense to focus on explainability. We, there's a lot of things we can't deal with, but let's keep improving explainability. And maybe today, you know, Uplift of performance versus transparency is, a, is an equation we can deal with easily, and maybe that will change over time. But I think the underlying principle, which is that we don't know what future regulation is, we don't know what future uh, social issues there are. So let's keep focusing on explainability. It makes sense scientifically, it makes sense socially, and it makes sense for, uh, for adoption. So I think it's a huge theme, and it's one that we're very focused on. If I can just touch on, on something that Jeremy talked about, which is we're really at the start of a journey. And so for us, being in financial services and banking, you know, we're heavily regulated. We have over 100 regulators. And so this is literally the start of the conversation with the regulators mm -hmm. about how are we using AI, how do we do expandability, um, and, and getting them starting to be comfortable on the fact that actually the techniques that we're utilizing, leveraging machine learning, especially. Uh, we think are more superior to, you know, more traditional methods. Uh, and so there's a lot of work that, that's still to be done with the regulators on this topic. 
Eve, do you want to talk to your experience there? No, absolutely. I mean, explainability is uh, extremely important, and uh, we have to be very humble uh, there. That's still the very beginning of that, so we are dedicating a lot of our researchers to those uh, mm -hmm. initiatives, partnering with the various universities and trying to understand, again, as an ecosystem, uh, how to tackle that. You have a technical uh, thing there, is that what a model sees is quite different from what a human sees in them. So it's very difficult, it's not, it's not, it's not easy to uh, be able to match what the model uh, results uh, are and what, not, not the results, but the, the, the inherent parts of the models and uh, what the human can take a decision on. So we have to bring a lot of trust first that system to build that, then we will be able to encourage the adoption, and then you will actually drive the business value. And it goes in that order. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you can see in the regulated environments is that the law um, forces you to um, analyze your data, uh, for example, the uh, American Algorithm Act, <laughs> on only a small set of, uh, uh, of aspects. And uh, once the, the, the regulators will have understood uh, even better, and we can help them uh, doing that actually, we think that there are untapped opportunities and a lot of value to automate a lot of those decisions based on those, uh, on those subsets of, uh, of, uh, of aspects. So we, 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 are, we are supporting that. We need that ethical uh, AI uh, we, we, we can do without it. That's very important. Secure AI, mass adoption. And you may have seen uh, also the European Commission uh, with the high-level expert committee. Um, our CEO and founder, co-founder, Jeff Gagné, is actually, the, I think, the, the only non-European uh, to sit in that committee. They actually recently released uh, a framework called the a Framework for uh, Ethical and Trustworthy AI. And I encourage you really to read that. That's just the beginning. Of the journey, then we need to apply that to various industries and to and to grasp uh, what is inside. But the, it sets a couple of points to consider when we are actually building, releasing, and interacting with AI in the real world. Okay. And since we're here in London, we should probably remember that uh, um, refer to the UK Data and Ethics uh, Committee, which is also um, doing some great work in this space. The spirit is the one that you, exactly as you said, we've got to be humble, we've got to learn together. This stuff is really complicated, but transparency has got to be a, a watchword for all of us. Yeah, and absolutely, and Eve mentioned working with universities in that area as well. And just to move the conversation on to expand the ecosystem even wider than just the commercial elements, uh, Jeremy, could you take, talk to how you work with universities and the importance of that? Sure. I mean, I mean, it, it's. I was reflecting with some colleagues about these events, and it's amazing these days. Uh, you know, a few years ago, you go to an event and you could recognise a CEO uh, and differentiate them from a student or a potential employee. Nowadays, you have to treat everybody the same, which is great. Uh, so, in the audience, there may be CEOs and colleagues and clients and competitors, but there are also people looking for jobs. And obviously, uh, we have to think about all of those things. So, uh, obviously, talent. We're all super competitors in that respect uh, for talent, whatever else happens. Um, and so having great relationships with universities helps. I think pushing the research is really important. So we do not only internships, but joint research programs uh, with a bunch of universities around the world uh, to the point of potentially working on specific problems. So it's nice to get an intern from, uh, you know, from a leading university and actually have them work with one of our teams on a specific problem. Uh, and then there's this longer term stuff where we're funding directly in the universities uh, some of the work that's been in. But in all of those um, areas, competition for talent, learning, uh, and, uh, and applying that talent to real, to real problems, I think there's fantastic opportunities. And it is a part of the ecosystem. And Montreal, um, where you guys are based and we have an office, is a great example of that. Milo, where you have the Montreal um, Institute for Learning Algorithms, you've got universities, you've got employers, you've got startups, you've got all sorts of people coming together, and I think that's the future. Yeah. And Chuck, as an enterprise, how do you find attracting talent in this space? Oh. It's, it's very competitive and it's, it's very challenging. You have to start the relationships with academia very early, similar to what Jeremy's saying in terms of whether or not it's engagement in terms of sponsorships, projects, uh, uh, getting very actively involved in them. 
Um, but just touching on what Jeremy was saying about Mila and Montreal, and this is sort of what, what I was saying earlier, is you know, part of what I feel very strongly about is that need to create a further convergence, especially here in the UK, between academia, um, some of the uh, research uh, institutions, as well as with industry, to start to solve those problems. And the ecosystem in Montreal that Quantum Black and, and, and a, uh, Element AI are part of is a good example of, of where that works. With your sort of deeper academic background in this area, Eve, can you talk to how, how companies can work better with universities to solve some of these challenges? Yeah, indeed. Well, LMR AI was funded and co-funded by Joshua Bengio, uh, who is also the scientific director of the, of the MILA that you've mentioned. So for us, really the research, uh, the academic research is uh, extremely important. And above that, the interaction with the various um, academic uh, institutions, which means that uh, of course, we've hired a lot of scientists. So we, we are about 550 people now and about 100, a bit more, 100 PhDs in AI, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and operational research. But we also have a network of fellows that remain in the academia. There are actually uh, researchers, professors, who want to dedicate two hours or two days of their time per week to projects that are important uh, for the ecosystem uh, and for LMRAI, for example. We are mentioning explainability. Uh, there is also sustainability, for example. Uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, the, how to include the, the diversity and having algorithms with uh, as less biases as we can uh, and as less uh, non-discriminatory aspect as we can. And then, of course, the classical NLP computer vision, etc. So this fellow, uh, the, this fellow networks uh, span across the globe. So we have a lot of them uh, started mm -hmm. in, uh, in Montreal, in Toronto, Edmonton, and then uh, in North America and, uh, and further away, so here in, uh, in Europe and in, uh, in Asia. So the, th the key is really to uh, make them converge on meaningful problems they're passionate about, that they want to solve, that are really very difficult to do it in, to do in isolation in your uh, lab uh, at the university, in the large corporation, startup. So that's really how to work together on those kind of initiatives. Here in London, uh, we have actually our applied research lab uh, that is dedicated to the AI for good. So we are working primarily with NGOs, non-governmental uh, organizations, on uh, a couple of subjects. Maybe you've seen in the press the Amnesty International uh, project that we've done about uh, uh, the uh, anti-harassment uh, <laughs> initiatives around the, 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 uh, the Twitter feeds, etc. So that was last December. So these are types of uh, contribution as well uh, mm -hmm. that we do that uh, help on our rallying the uh, the, the research institutions uh, with, uh, with us, not only for LMRDI, but to contribute to uh, the ecosystem through LMRDI, which is uh, a nuance here. <laughs> okay, great. So to move the conversation on to um, back to the commercialization side of things, um, one of the big things that's talked about AI, which makes it different from some other technologies, as a startup, uh, a number of years ago, you would have come up with an idea for a product, built a technology, and then looked to sell that product. With AI, it's sort of different. You need to get access to the data. And the, the, in AI, the data is famously being called the new oil. Um, so this is, makes it a difference. It makes an incentive to have the bigger enterprise companies that have the data. How do they have a different business model to interact with companies that want to use that data to build value add for their business? So is there, is there new models of um, deployment models or engagement models that can be used throughout this ecosystem to solve these problems? That's a, that's a challenging question. Barbara, I'm going to throw that towards you. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess being a relatively unknown in this space, having the credibility of awesome uh, big players that are, so for example, I'm going to touch on the NHS again, um, you know, they're in a non-competitive space for themselves, so we're working, um, optimizing their blood demand, uh, to blood, uh, sorry again, blood supply chain optimization, using AI to predict which donor is going to show up, you know, how much blood they're going to collect, and where it needs to go uh, to improve patient care, to reduce logistics, etc. So, um, you know, that, they, they own that space within healthcare in the UK, but if we can commercialize that across the rest of the world, um, using the NHS 
um, kind of, I guess, know-how and knowledge, um, then they can get a commercial rebate, I guess, on that as well. So it kind of works for everyone in so far as they want to optimize their own business, but then also we can then, you know, if we can sell it onwards, um, with everyone can then you know, join that commercial success. So I think it's like, you know, there's ways to think about non-competing sectors where you've got the data uh, where it doesn't feel so contentious, or maybe there's some areas that you think could do good that you think, actually, I can use this to help another organization. Now, there's tons of laws you can put in, you know, contracts you can put in place for data, but everyone's a bit nervous of it at the moment. So I think the more that more people can do it, it can show the greater power it can have. You can look at different commercial models and it's a really exciting space. So I think, yeah, watch out for it. And if anyone's got any ideas, let me know. <laughs> Jeremy, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, it is obvious that we can't, uh, we can't get results with that data. Um, I, I kind of the way we look at it, there's broadly speaking sort of three buckets, I guess. There's publicly available data, which we can all access at any one time. There's sort of uh, owned data by others, externally owned data by others. So you get um, you know, healthcare data sets or you might get insurance data sets which are owned by specialists in that space. And we're seeing an emergence of like data brokers now. There's a whole business coming through there. And then obviously the third bucket is obviously our data, whoever we are. You know, if you're a bank or you know, you're within your own organization, you have your own data. Um, and I think the sort of uh, the kind of really uh, exciting opportunity is to think about how you can combine all of those things to produce even more value than you could if you were just working with one of them. And I think it's, I agree totally, it's moving very fast. I think particularly in the medical space, uh, there are lots of challenges. Um, I think we're going to see more stuff moving very fast there. I think the trick is to come back to, you know, the, the start of this is to sort of start with what you've got. Uh, and, and work from there to optimize, and then you can add more and more and more and more, and maybe move from optimizing to disrupting and moving into new spaces. But I think it's helpful to think about those three big buckets and how combining them can help you create even more value. Mm. Chuck, have you, look, you looked at some of those areas in Project Phoenix? Well, we have, and obviously I'm a huge believer about the fact that you know, we need to take you know, what we traditionally have looked at as almost a liability, having a data state that sort of spread over many geographies and many different systems and pulling it together and starting to harness it. Um, so I, I think that that's clearly something that, that we're striving for. I think, and, and this is sort of what I was trying to articulate in, in my presentation is, I think the nature of the relationship between large corporates like ourselves and whether or not it's consulting firms, uh, software companies, technology firms, does have to change. It has to be much more of a partnership, but also because there is a journey to this, right? How do we utilize this data? What can we utilize the data for? Much less, how do we marry that with some of the new techniques and that are out there? Um, it's going to require some discovery and it's going to require some experimentation. And a lot of times for a large corporate or even for a, a large tech company, people aren't necessarily always willing to experiment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think fundamentally that's going to be required. Neve, how have you found that element? Yeah. Again, I mean, internal data, external data, public data, and maybe synthesize data as well when you've identified a couple of gaps or when you want actually I to, that's a to, <laughs> 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 to have an ecosystem, yeah. a complete English language. <laughs> so uh, in order to have um, the, the, uh, a diversity uh, of data to bring uh, on the table and to really build the best models that will be sustainable, that will anticipate also the future needs uh, of an organization or of a, a sector, uh, as a matter of fact. So there is also um, the, the aspect of making sure that the, the data will be streamlined and that the fact that you will get the um, the refreshment or refreshing, how do you say, <laughs> of that data yeah. uh, for the training of the model. Yep. So that indeed when you have to deal with such a diversity in terms of geography and probably um, uh, métier as well, domains in the, in, in the company, how to make it sure, how to organize that data, how to not necessarily organize but make the people understand, the domain experts and the IT uh, groups, that the data will be used with uh, a certain dynamics now, and that it's not data has a repository that will sit there, but that it's live data. Yeah. So uh, how to uh, ensure that it brings uh, the concern around the management of the data, the 
policy around the data. That is one of the big topics that we can address indeed in that kind of discovery uh, aspect. And uh, also how to convince the procurement uh, teams uh, that uh, some of the data needs to be uh, a little bit more open uh, <laughs> and uh, that it's, uh, it used to be. So. Just on that point about commercialization, I think there's an interesting theme here. Right? We know that we can see the beginnings. We talked about data as an asset. We can also, we've also seen the beginnings of data potentially as a liability, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not looking after it properly or you're not managing it. I think the next point we're going to get to, here's a prediction for you. I think data will be on the balance sheet. And I think companies will be, at some point in the future, will be judged on how good they are at making the most of their data or, or whether it could be a liability. So I think, so anyone who's having trouble with procurement, try that argument. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sadly, we face what, what Jeremy's almost talking about in terms of our regulators are all over us looking at our data quality and actually wanting to see our critical data elements yeah. and our data quality measurements and seeing those results. So, you know, it's something that we, data quality is something we have to absolutely embed in all, all that we do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. And I think we have just time for one final point. Talking about the ecosystem, talking about pulling these partnerships together. Um, is it realistic for startups to work with these bigger companies? And if so, how do they how do they do that? Um, Jeremy, do you want to do you want to talk to that one first? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we we were a startup ten years ago. We're now not quite as big as Element AI, but we've got a few hundred data scientists. Um, uh, data engineers, designers, all these uh, product managers and so on. And we've grown because we've collaborated with large companies and others. Uh, I, think, I think we have to stay humble and we have to keep saying that. We will only have impact if we work with domain specialists. We have to figure out how to make that work. We have to help the incumbents as well as the disruptors navigate the space. Um, but I think if we do it together, I think there's a, just a huge opportunity. But it's a uh, it does require that leadership and it requires that vision and I think this sort of shared energy that hopefully people can feel here to keep us pushed forward and more open source. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Barbara, how have you found working with bigger companies? Yeah, I mean, we thought that it would be a lot more challenging than it has been um, because I think there's a real fan confidence in startups that there wasn't a few years ago. So procurement levels have dropped. People, you know, C-suite will call us up, even CEOs, and say, I'm really, really want to talk to you guys. So, I mean, that's really encouraging. And, you know, I think everyone should go for it. But I think in the same sense of um, people are still trying to navigate this space and want people to do, you know, big end ends and maybe, you know, there's a different way to think about how to approach working with startups and just, you know, do try, do try and prove it out and, you know, figure out how you can sandbox that in a really contained way. And uh, although we like high value opportunities, there is some way to try and figure out how to make it work with a startup that you can really prove out really quickly and easily on your cloud or wherever that is to be, um, to get that confidence and to see what the, the, they can do. Because I think AI as well has become a bit of a generic term and actually there's a lot of values, you know, AI isn't, isn't equal. There's definitely higher quality AI than not. And until you try it out, you do, don't even know which questions to ask. So yeah, to get under the skin, just try it out with some startups and go for it. Okay. Eve, do you want to... Absolutely. Well, it takes leadership. Uh, we, we, we are coming back to that. Leadership for, uh, from an organization uh, as uh, HSBC, uh, Chuck, and uh, the sponsors that uh, you managed to uh, to get at the, at the highest level. So uh, this leadership is extremely important. We are pioneers here. Uh, so it requires talent, it requires uh, uh, data, that's for sure, but it requires a vision and leadership to execute on it. Uh, that's why with, uh, for this collaboration, we've mentioned this discovery process. That's very much a discovery. Let's learn, let's learn together, let's learn with an ecosystem. That's how we will succeed. Let's make it sure that we remain humble uh, and let's also weigh in when we know things, uh, when we want to build a good AI, let's be vocal around that. Mm -hmm. Let's also uh, maybe spearhead some initiatives with the government. Let's work in this together, academics, small companies, startups, large management consulting group, and uh, enterprises. Mm -hmm. So that's a, it's a fantastic journey, but it's just the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I agree absolutely with what my panelists have, uh, have said. The one thing I would also add is there, there has to be an open mind and flexibility on both sides. So for the large corporates, yes, we may have a way of this is how we do things, this is our approach, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, we need to be much more flexible to bring uh, 
startups on board, to sandbox, to, to, to work with them and educate them about some of our problems, et cetera. And then the flip side, on the other side, they also need to be much more flexible in listening to these are the problems we're trying to solve mm -hmm. and how, do, as opposed to just you know, providing this is the product or this is our platform, actually, how do we work together to solve those problems? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, this has been a great discussion. Uh, thank you very much to everyone on the panel. I think everyone's been very engaging and very open with their answers. Thank you very much.